So the next talk would be uh, surgical approaches for pineal tumors. Uh, professor Gomenerova. So Lily Gomenerova was a former professor and director of pediatric brain tumor uh, section at the Boston Children's Hospital, uh, Harvard University. She's a very eminent professor at uh, Children's Hospital of Boston, done a lot of publications and book chapters in uh, pediatric brain tumors, especially and uh, endoscopic uh, approaches. Actually, uh, Lily is a great friend and a mentor through a whole uh, almost 14, 15 years. We've been uh, knowing each other for a long time. So please, Lily, can you uh, start your presentation? All right, thank you. Uh, I will get my presentation. All right, do you have it? Perfect, perfect. Okay, so um, uh, thank you Llewellyn and Mohammed, uh, for asking me to give this talk. Um, and I just want to have a question. How much time do we have? I don't want to really run over terribly. About 20 minutes? 20, 20 25 minutes, yes. Okay, yes. very good. Okay, so, so I was given a Herculean task to discuss surgical approaches for pineal tumors in 20 minutes. So I will try and do my best here. Um, so I, I think the objectives of my talk are going to be to define the indications for surgery. And they're going to be based on the biology, what the goals of surgery are going to be. Uh, is it going to be biopsy, resection, CSF flow management, and then types of surgery, endoscopic, open, meaning craniotomy or a combination of both. And then when I discuss surgical approaches, I will briefly talk uh, about supratentorial approaches, posterior transcolosal, and then the suboccipital transtentorial interhemispheric approach, and the infratentorial supracerebellar approach, and then combined approaches, and in that context also CSF management. So those are going to be the objectives of the talk. Uh, and um, I want to also keep the talk in the context of what are the advances in the management of pineal area tumors that we have experienced over the uh, past 20 years. And uh, for me, the development and endoscopic um, technology has really been critical in the management of pineal area tumors. Secondly, the understanding of some of the biology and utilization of markers and then adjuvant therapy. So these are the three critical components that have changed the management of pineal area tumors over the past 20 years. Um, and no discussion can be without a very brief uh, image of the anatomy because that actually really imp um, uh, impacts our outcomes. And here's the pineal gland in the center of the brain. And there is the aqueduct and you can see the tectal plate and the brainstem with the quadrigeminal, uh, the, the midbrain and the brainstem here in front and the corpus callosum and cerebellum. The critical structures, third ventricle, choroid plexus, and then the vessels um, and the thickened arachnoid around it. Anyone who is dealing with pineal area tumors needs to know this anatomy cold and needs to be aware of it, uh, when it whether you're doing an endoscopic procedure or whether you're doing an open craniotomy because you can get into trouble in those areas doing both. Now, several important features about pineal tumors that made them unique in the pediatric population. Most pineal surgery is performed in the adult populations for diseases such as meningioma and some of the high-grade glioblastoma and occasionally pineocytoma. That is not what we have in the pediatric population. And you can actually see in the pediatric population, it is mostly germ cell tumors and those can be germ or the mixed germ cell tumors. 
some mature teratomas and pineoblastomas. The vein of Galen are in infants, and then occasionally we have choroid plexus tumors, triretinoblastoma, and the occasional astrocytoma and ependymoma. So really we're talking about germ cell tumors, some pineoblastomas, rare astrocytomas. And uh, in the pineal region tumors, this is a good um, graph that uh, an Egyptian fellow of mine and I published in Child's Nervous System a number of years ago, Mohamed Zazu. It's uh, looking at pineal region tumors and understanding which tumors are commonly seen and their biology. So commonly seen germinomas, which have a fairly good uh, outcome low risk, and then we have uh, increasing risk, the germinoma with sensitive trophoblastic components and the mixed germ cell tumors. And then rarely we have teratomas. So 65% germinomas, and then 17% of mixed germ cell tumors and 18% teratomas. The pineal parenchymal tumors, which represent 15 to 30% of the pineal tumors, are either the pineocytomas, which are rarely seen in the pediatric population and mostly in adult, uh, then the pineoblastomas and this unusual tumor, pineal parenchymal tumor of in intermediate differentiation and the papillary tumor of pineal region. We don't really know much about the biology of this one and these two are high grade. So it is important for us as pediatric neurosurgeons to know what kind of tumors we see in the pediatric pineal area because that really man determines how we manage them. And what is the clinical presentation? You, these, patient, these tumors represent 0.4 to 1% of all intracranial tumors, 3 to 8% in the pediatric population, slightly higher in the Far East and Japan. And there usually is a 4 to 1 male to female ratio most within the first three decades of life and the non-germinomatous germ cell tumors are commonly seen in males in the first two decades of life. Classic presentation is that of hydrocephalus, Perrineau syndrome, and it's very important whenever you have a patient who has a large tumor to look in the supracellar area and also to evaluate for diabetes insipidus, other endocrinopathies and presence of visual disturbance as there can be synchronous germinomas in the pineal and supracellar region, or this could be a mixed germ cell tumor with both supracellar and pineal tumor. And there's also an unusual presentation of precocious puberty uh, or diabetes insipidus alone with involvement of the pituitary stalk alone and germinoma. So um, most commonly germinomas, hydrocephalus. And um, what we now have uh, known for a number of years is that we can distinguish germ cell tumors by the presence of ser serum and CSF markers. So in a simplistic way, germinomatous or what are called germinomas will have very mild elevations in the beta HCG in either the serum or CSF. They do not have elevation in AFP and that's very important and PLAP, which is something that can be tested but is not routinely done, is usually felt to be present in intracranial germinomas. One thing to know is the syncytiotrophoblastic subtype of uh, germinomas can also have elevations in beta HCG. Non germinomatous tumors have very high elevations of beta HCG, and the highest ones are in choriocarcinomas moderate in embryonal carcinoma, very high elevations of alpha fetoprotein in yolk sac tumors, followed by the embryonal tumors and the immature teratomas. And if you have uh, a very high level of CSF of beta HCG of above 50 units or AFP, then you most likely have a non-germinomatous germ cell tumor. Um, serum titers tend to be higher than CSF titers and one thing that's very important is that you have to obtain both CSF and serum markers. And for beta HCG, it's critical that you 
uh, get the actual levels that your lab and your hospital does and ev evaluate them that way. So in pineal air germ cell tumors, we can make a diagnosis based on serum and CSF markers. And we now know that chemotherapy can be initiated after a diagnosis and obviates the need for tumor surgery at time of presentation. This is a shift from the way we managed pineal tumors 30 years ago. And then markers are used postoperatively to monitor response to chemotherapy, follow the patients to see if there is any relapse of tumor and to then initiate subsequent therapy. So clearly for pineal area germ cell tumors, markers are the way to go. And just as a comment, market elevations of alpha fetoprotein carry a poorer prognosis. So what are the goals of surgery for pineal area tumors? Clearly establishing pathologic diagnosis, managing hydrocephalus, which is often the most common presenting procedure, and then maybe resection of tumor. So the questions I always ask is, is a tissue sample always needed? Do we have to put a VP shunt in or do we do an ETV? Is resection always indicated? And what is the morbidity of the above procedures? So my talk is going to really focus on these questions. So here is an example of a pineal area tumor. Um, and to emphasize and reiterate again, critically important MRI of brain and spine at presentation and to obtain serum and CSF markers. Now in a patient who has hydrocephalus with a large tumor in that location that has not been treated, you cannot perform a lumbar puncture. You obtain the CSF through the endoscopic approach um, when you do your ETV and or biopsy. And the endoscopy is for multiple purposes. You treat the hydrocephalus, you can do an endoscopic biopsy. And I put endoscopic resection because they are isolated case reports, but that is not the standard. And then maybe surgery. So this particular case here, you can see this tumor, that's the tumor that's peaking in the aqueduct. And this actually turned out to be a low-grade glioma. So again, history physical, imaging, very important to obtain brain lab MRI uh, because that will help with your surgical planning, the markers, and then you treat the hydrocephalus. I <clears throat> was lucky to work in an environment where we saw patients and we could treat them immediately. So they did not have to have a shunt placed. In environments where you don't have the luxury to do that, it is um, done to take care of the hydrocephalus. So um, I think shunt may be placed. However, one has to be careful that in some of patients, especially with the mixed germ cell tumors, there is evidence that there can be dissemination, albeit rarely. So I very strongly advocate for the use of endoscopy to perform ETV to treat the hydrocephalus and then potentially do a biopsy of the tumor if it's feasible and safe for the patient. Now for the surgeons, um, I think it's very important when you do this to think of the anatomy. And um, it's important to obtain your navigation MRI uh, so that you can actually plan your surgical uh, procedure. So very important to think where is going to be the location of your borehole. I performed the biopsies and the ETVs through a single borehole utilizing a 30 degree scope so I can rotate the scope and can do both the ETV and the biopsy at the same sitting uh, without uh, doing much manipulation. Um, there, so you plan your borehole so you can actually access both through a single borehole. You evaluate the size of the lateral ventricles, the size of the third ventricle, evaluate the size of the foramen of Monroe and the relationship of the tumor to all the other anatomic structures. And then uh, at the time of surgery, you look at the ependema and the lining of the tumor. So those are very important as you're planning your surgical procedure and your endoscopic biopsy. And then um, 
this is the kind of view that you can see. I use primarily an SQLab system, but there are many systems, GOB stores, um, and also some of the newer flexible endoscopes. So um, for those of you who use endoscopes or are learning how to use endoscope, become familiar with one so that you are technically adept at that and use that. And you always need to use both a zero and a 30 degree scope to be able to get to the back. And this is a beautiful image of a, a germinoma in the aqueduct. And at time of surgery, you need to have a forceps, you need to have cautery. And I also like to use a holding device so that my hands are free and not tired from holding the instrument. Um, and uh, this is very uh, important to also have a good assistant who understands what you're doing. And obtain CSF both uh, for uh, markers and then uh, do a biopsy. You also need to have a pathologist who's going to be able to help you with all of this. And here are a couple of uh, illustrative images uh, this is a 19-year-old male who presented with headaches, blurry vision, and vomiting. This is his uh, preoperative image showing this very nice uh, germ cell tumor. This was a pure germinoma, and he was treated with radiation therapy, and now is over 10 years after his biopsy and treatment, and he is normal, intact as a college graduate without any evidence of disease and works as an accountant. Um, one thing that endoscopy is also very helpful is to evaluate extent of disease. So this is another teenage male who presented with headaches, and this, these are the images. There is uh, the lesion here, and you can actually see it here, but there's nothing in the floor of the third ventricle. Serum markers were non-contributory, he had papilledema, so we thought he had a germ cell tumor, a germinoma. What was very interesting at time of surgery is there is the tumor in the aqueduct, and this is the area of the biopsy. But look at the floor. The floor is irregular and atypical. So he most likely had some disease here that we could actually not see by imaging, but was probably there. So we actually incorporated that into his treatment, and he actually has done well without any evidence of disease. And these are pictures of a low-grade glioma in the pineal area. It looks somewhat different from the red appearing germ cell tumor. This is an image of the basilar artery after the ETV. And this is another picture of another type of a germ cell tumor. This is a mature teratoma in a seven-year-old who presented with disease in the pineal area, but also evidence of dissemination in the ventricle, you can actually see here. And also there was evidence of dissemination along the entire neural axis. Um, so this patient had an ETV and um, uh, then he had a resection of this very large mature teratoma and the remaining disease we did not treat and he's been followed with evidence of disseminated mature teratoma and is neurologically intact. So um, based on um, these kinds of pathologies, my fellow and I came up with a schema which actually appears complicated, but I will simplify it. If you have a pineal region tumor, you have evidence of hydrocephalus, you proceed with CSF diversion, hopefully with ETV and obtain markers. Markers negative needs a biopsy, markers positive, no biopsy, you proceed with treatment. And again, hydrocephalus absent, you get markers. If the markers are positive, you don't need a biopsy. If you have negative markers, then you need a tissue diagnosis, and then you either do a biopsy or a resection. And I won't go through all the complicated other uh, permutations here, because this has to do with response to therapy. But a couple of things, second look surgery, growing teratoma syndrome. These are concepts that uh, are relatively new and um, as surgeons, we need to think about those and every procedure that we need to do, we have to think, do I need to go and do another operation down the road? So this is the uh, management schema simplified. If you have a patient who has hydrocephalus, uh, 
you need to do a CSF diversion procedure associated maybe with a biopsy, obtain markers, and then based on the markers, either proceed with chemotherapy or obtain a tissue diagnosis either endoscopically or via craniotomy. If you do not have hydrocephalus, obtain your markers, and then you need to consider a craniotomy. So just to summarize, endoscopy and surgery, ETV to treat hydrocephalus, biopsy in select cases, but you may need to do surgery for diagnosis, you may need to do surgery for recurrence, and then there is surgery for groin teratoma syndrome and second look operation to evaluate for evidence of disease. Now, surgery for pineal area tumors is probably the most complicated procedure that we as pediatric neurosurgeons perform. And um, because of the complexity of it and the different approaches, I think that any neurosurgeon needs to decide what procedure they're most comfortable with and to become very good at doing that. There are different uh, surgical procedures, either in the sitting position, in the supine position with the head flexed, or in the prone position. My preference has always been to do the patient in the uh, prone position or in the young patient where the, I can do a, a posterior transcalosal approach supine. I do not like to do the sitting procedure. Um, it's critically important to manage hydrocephalus um, because at time of surgery, you cannot afford to have brain swelling. So you either do an ETV or you place an EVD. And it's up to you to decide whether you want to have the EVD done beforehand uh, the surgery a day or so, or at the time of the surgery. Um, Anti-epileptics and uh, steroids. I do not routinely use mannitol, but you can do it intraoperatively as necessary. Navigation is critically important and intraoperative assessment of extent of resection, whether it's with endoscope, ultrasound, or intraoperative MRI. And also think of your anatomy. So just to reinforce again, you need to, you're going to go either posterior transcolosal, interhemispheric, or supracerebellar. This area here, the veins of Galen and the <clears throat> internal cerebral veins and the basal veins, you need to understand the anatomy and its relationship to the normal structures and the arterial vessels and the tectum. Oftentimes the tumors will distort that anatomy and it is difficult. So be very, very careful. And injury to a vein can be fatal in this location or be associated with significant neurologic deficits. So this is a, a patient who had a very interesting case. Uh, he was two when he presented with hydrocephalus. And at that time we had imaging which did not demonstrate the presence of a pineal tumor. He had an ETV and six months later presented with what was a teratoma. And this was completely resected, recurred, and was treated subsequently with surgery and radiation therapy. So for this patient, I did the uh, suboccipital transtentorial approach and uh, we were able to visualize all of the normal structures he remained neurologically intact through all of that. Sadly, he passed away at age 20 because he committed suicide and had significant uh, psychiatric disease that was unrelated to his uh, tumor. But in this particular case, one could argue that you could operate on him via an infra uh, tentorial supracerebellar approach and my concern with that approach often is that you have retraction on the cerebellum. And at the end of the procedure, if you have swollen cerebellum, it may be difficult to manage the patient postoperatively. So whenever you think about surgical approaches, think of the postoperative management of the patient. Um, the, and, and just to go finish with that previous slide, that goal of surgery there was complete resection. Here is this patient who has a low-grade glioma that I showed you the images uh, earlier. And here, um, 
I approached this via a suboccipital transtentorial approach. My goal was not to do a complete resection because we know these tumors are infiltrative tumors and we know that there is excellent adjuvant therapy. So again, my goal of surgery here is targeted based on knowing what the pathology is. This patient had an endoscopic biopsy of this tumor and we knew it was a low grade glioma. So um, again, uh, knowing what the biology is and the location and trying to avoid complications. Uh, and he has never required a shunt. His uh, CSF management has always been with his ETV. And, and this is uh, an example of a patient who had a very complex syndrome, nine-year-old who presented with a mixed germ cell tumor in another country. Uh, he had a, an attempt at a biopsy slash resection, which was complicated by significant venous injury, multiple infarcts, CSF infection. And by the time he came to us, he was very neurologically impaired. However, uh, he actually did remarkably well, was treated for this very large tumor, which actually is a mixed germ cell tumor with a growing teratoma syndrome. So we were confronted with a situation where we had to remove this massive tumor. And this particular case I approached via transcolosal, posterior transcolosal um, so, uh, approach, again in the prone position. And um, uh, very important uh, for all of these craniotomies, when you do your craniotomy, make a large enough craniotomy. I do not like small craniotomies expose the superior sagittal sinus, the torcular and the transverse sinus, and make sure that your opening of the dura is sufficient that you have adequate uh, visualization. I use a retractor uh, system uh, on the occipital uh, lobe and gently retract it, and then uh, open the uh, tentorium as per the standard approaches. Um, in this particular case, uh, intraoperative visualization was critical because you needed to do a complete resection and an endoscope was very, very helpful. And ultimately we were able to do a complete resection of this uh, patient. So the goal here was gross total resection. Um, this patient had his CSF treated prior with a shunt. And the importance with any surgeries to avoid new neurologic deficits. So it's critically important to identify normal anatomy and structures, retraction with intermittent relaxation, microscope. And we are very lucky because we were able to do an intraoperative MRI and documented complete resection of this tumor. Nothing, uh, you can do the best operation, but you need to have incredibly good postoperative management and you need an excellent anesthesia team and uh, an ICU team and to make sure that you don't have post-operative seizures, intra uh, swelling or bleeding. Those things can make the most perfect operation a terrible outcome if you do not manage them properly. So I think that all credit for us as neurosurgeons needs to be shared with the other teams. And this patient, just to follow up, he's now disease-free seven years after surgery with a single shunt system, normal markers, and no evidence of disease. So um, I know there's not very much time, but I want to conclude that in neurosurgery, tremendous advances have been uh, occurring with all of this new technology. But the important thing is a team and in the operating room, your MR technologist, nurses, and anesthesia staff are very, very important. And uh, in the end, it's a comprehensive team and programmatic approach uh, for our success in uh, taking care of these complex tumors. So in management of pineal area tumors, surgical advances, especially with endoscopy, understanding biology and adjuvant therapy have shifted us from operating on a lot of these to not really doing significant operation in this very treacherous area, but we are able to treat a lot of the germ cell tumors with management of CSF only and uh, then adjuvant therapy. So getting back to our uh, questions, is a tissue sample always needed? No. Uh, 
VP shunt insertion versus ETV in de depending on your resources and your settings. Is resection always indicated? No. And all of this, we need to always think of the morbidity of, of the above procedures. What is the biology of the disease and what is the expectation for the patient overall? And I just want to thank everyone. And I hope that in the 20 or so minutes, I was able to give you some ideas on surgery for pineal tumors. Thank you. I'm happy thank to- Thank you, Lily, for a very interesting presentation as usual. There are some questions from the attendees. Of course. One of them is, uh, is there any role of urine sampling for beta HCG in diagnosis of germ cell tumors? This is from Lawrence. I am not aware of any, and um, I think it's really serum and a CSF that are the standards. Okay, and another question was, uh, do you follow up patients with both serum as well as CSF markers? I think Mark had answered the question and proper assessment of tumor marker is both serum and CSF. Absolutely. So both preoperatively and postoperatively, serum and CSF. So preoperatively, either at the time of the ETV, or uh, via an LP, depending on what the patient's neurologic and uh, imaging status is. And then post-operatively and to follow uh, disease and response to therapy, it is both serum via uh, and CSF via lumbar puncture. So yeah, both of those. Yeah, and Mohammed, and the, my, point was, my point was just um, to remind yeah. people that sometimes with a brain tumor, you can have a negative CSF and a positive serum and certainly frequently a positive CSF, but a negative serum. So you really should be doing both if you're gonna follow them comprehensively. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And also the other thing is um, for the beta HCG, you have to get a quantitative evaluation. So do not get fooled to say, oh, I'm going to order a pregnancy test, which I have seen some people have done. It has to be a quantitative analysis. Mm -hmm. There is another question about the stereotactic biopsy or endoscopic biopsy. So, uh, so that think? Uh, I think to some extent depends on the location of the tumor. So if you have um, a patient who will need hydrocephalus treatment, you have large ventricles and the tumor can be seen uh, with your endoscope, I would do it. But again, it depends on how facile you are with your endoscope. And if you also have pathologists who are going to be able to make a diagnosis with a relatively small sample. Now, um, I think a stereotactic biopsies can also be treacherous for the same reason that surgery is treacherous. You have a lot of vessels and uh, tumors that can also be fairly vascular. So both germinoma and mixed germ cell tumors are very vascular tumors. So, um, and, and, and that was the big morbidity 30 plus years ago when I was in training. Um, people did not like to operate on germinomas because they bled. And um, you can imagine if you do a stereotactic biopsy and you have a hemorrhage in that location can be devastating. So I've been very reluctant to do that stereotactically, uh, but I can understand why in some situations it may be something that can be done. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Stereotactic biopsy is very risky in this uh, in this region. Yeah, I had some complications with stereotactic biopsy, much more than endoscopy. Yeah, yeah. because yeah. Of the venous system. Yeah, there is another question about the bineoplastoma. Do you do a uh, do you do do you do, do you go for total excision of a bineoplastoma once diagnosed? Yeah. Yeah, so, so those are tough ones. Uh, yes, I think ideally you should try and do a gross total resection pineoblastoma. Um, so, but again, uh, it all depends on um, what the anatomy is and what are the um, uh, risks associated with it. But yes, uh, for pineoblastoma, that would be my, uh, my goal of surgery. Okay. Any more questions or comments? 
مودي بروفيسور غندور عن يولا No, I think uh, it's a very uh, well covered, extensively and very well covered uh, lecture. I think it's uh, it's a great learning experience for those of us who go to the pediatrics, uh, not so often, but do so. Uh, so thank you very much for a very, very illustrative lecture. Yeah, Professor Al-Gandur is here. Uh, yes, uh, yes, Mohammed. Uh, I enjoyed the lecture of Lily actually, and uh, she puts a protocol of treatment for pioneer vision tumors, and that's very important. Listening to this talk, uh, I think it was uh, very important uh, guidelines uh, for all pediatric neurosurgeons. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, Mohammed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, 